Today is Wednesday, some month 21st, and this is Block Digest 188 at block height 591,127. So what? what's up, Rick? What's up, Nopara? What's up, Janine? What's up, technical errors? How's oh, it going? Yeah. Oh, just uh, like as always, like you're saying, just getting used to this new space in the mumble, but yeah, it's starting to get towards the end of the month. Things are... Still blazing hot here in Colorado, but I think that's going to change. So, uh, yeah, how are you guys doing? Uh, Janine, how are you? Is the weather where you're at? Oh, God, please tell me the weather is not going to be blazing hot in a week. <laughs> oh, yeah. Because I'm going to be there. Yeah, actually, I think the week you're coming, um, you know, things are set to cool down a little bit. But um, I don't know. We're going to have to see because these weather guys, they're not too great at predicting this mountain climate. But what about you, uh, Nopar? What's going on with you this morning? The weather is great, except that allergy season came and it is crazy. I wanted to leave this country, <laughs> but turned out I have a couple of weddings and things that have to go somewhere, so I can't leave, and now I'm I'm nearly dead. <laughs> oh, yeah, got those obligations to take care of. But yeah, like Janine was saying, like you're supposed to be flying over here sometime soon. You got a presentation. That's something I've been thinking a lot about. I'm sure you've been getting prepared, looking at. What you're gonna try and achieve while you're out here? Uh, I'm not sure what you're talking about. Bum, bum. <laughs> not you, Janine. Uh, well, I'm going to be speaking. That's about it. I don't know what I'm going to accomplish. <laughs> yeah. All right. We'll get something done. It'll be great fun to have it. Just the whole crew around. Okay, so uh, I don't know. Go start bullshit more meme. Play inappropriate songs. No, man. Yeah, I think we should just uh, get right into this because yeah, there's a lot to talk about and some pretty big news from the start. Like uh, what you got to tell us about these uh, new contracts that are coming. I mean, we've been talking about them forever, but it seems like what? they're officially on the way. What? Contracts I mean law. Law means government. Government is bad. This is bad. This is all bad. <laughs> Nothing good can come of this. I don't know, man. I think the market is ready for these backed contracts. So why don't you tell us, like, what, what's the deal? They got approved, but what's going on? Yeah. Um, so they, long and short, were originally trying to just self-certify themselves. Um, but needed an exemption from the CFTC to self-custody assets, which is completely against the norm uh, with these types of products trading on major exchanges. And that was pretty much the core of all of the, the delays since they announced this last year. And I think, I want to say like around two or three months ago, they decided to go around that and um, register... Um, the backed uh, trust company with the New York State Department of Financial Services um, to become a qualified custodian through that entity and then no longer need the CFTC approval. Uh, or uh, not approval, I'm sorry, the CFTC exemption um, from the traditional custody rules. And so what's happened now is the CFTC has approved them through self-certification 
and the NYSDFS has um, approved the back trust company. So they are now completely set up to move forward. Um, this backed trust company is effectively the core of the backed business, and it's going to be um, custodying and holding the actual Bitcoin that is going to be used to settle these future contracts. And then the contracts themselves will be trading on the Intercontinental Exchange Futures US Exchange and cleared by Ice Clear US. And so effectively, like all backed is really doing in the grand scheme of this is running this custody business and then handling the settlements for products listed on traditional um, New York exchanges. So like back is not in the traditional sense an exchange like you think of Kraken or Coinbase. It's effectively just this custody company that's going to have these products trading uh, on an actual uh, legacy stock exchange. And so, you know, this is pretty much all of the red tape they've been dealing with for the past year or so, um, you know, dealt with. And they're going to be launching, I think, September 23rd is the target. But they're going to be launching with um, a daily and a monthly futures contract. So two separate contracts, one that will settle every 24 hours and one that will settle every month. And the reason that they're doing these two different time periods here is because backed, um, their contracts that are trading on ICE are not going to be using an index of spot exchanges. Like they are actually going to be hitting their own settlement price. And so with these two different products, they're trying to get a product that allows fast exposure and settlement, but then also something that will allow traders who trade this product to price things over longer time horizons. And so kind of cover, you know, the, the short and long term bases in terms of time horizons to allow backed uh, products to actually have their own settlement price instead of just looking to other exchanges in the market uh, to decide, you know, what price to settle that. I mean, you know, really at this point, like it's just, you know, this next month they're going to be onboarding customers and then things are going to go live in September. And we are really going to see how much of the existing market would prefer a product like this over existing exchanges. And then also really just how much demand there is pent up for a Bitcoin product, but you know, not willing to kind of deal with the current state of things. Yeah, I mean, I think there's definitely a lot of people out the door trying to get a product like this. I mean, I think everybody that's kind of been awaiting an ETF, you know, you hear about people talking about the on-ramps that are currently available, and then you hear something about backed, and it just, the figures, the figures involved are just so much bigger to where I think it does give people some sort of security i do kind of i'm kind of curious as to like uh you know how many people do want the physical bitcoin and how many people want to custody that and want to take on that and i mean this is like where you know this thing gets me excited i'm thinking about okay bitcoins are actually going to be coming off exchanges now they're physically delivered and like what will that do to liquidity and what will that do to the price and yeah i mean i think these are a big deal i mean coming down the pipe in a month from now, pretty much, I mean, a month and a couple of days, I think they're set to launch September 23rd. And like you said, I mean, they started going around this process of, you know, getting out of the way of that CFTC legislation. And they just uh, went around that a couple of months ago. And it seems like a couple of months ago was whenever we started to see some of this whole Bitcoin altcoin decoupling and a recent bull cycle. So yeah, I think that this is definitely something big. I think that we're going to see a lot of people rush into this. But I am still curious. Yeah, like how many people want to custody this thing and hold Bitcoins himself? I think, uh, I don't know, we'll see. Well, I mean, ultimately, like, you can just use Bax custody function and not hold it yourself. But like, ultimately, I think the the more important thing here is just that you can have the Bitcoin delivered yourself. And now, you know, with, with Bact going live and their products on ICE, and then you have the 
CME futures trading in Chicago. I mean, like there is now fully regulated um, ways to expose yourself to Bitcoin, either just through, um, you know, exposure to the price volatility with dollars or something like Bact, where you actually, you know, can have the Bitcoin physically delivered. And, you know, when Bact is live, like there is an option now for institutional players who want to do either of those that is completely covered and regulated from end time. And I mean, you know, I think that there will be over time a huge demand for that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not going to say like that I think there will be a huge explosion in volume like the second it launches. Like, I mean, just look at the, the CBOE futures and the CME futures. Like that took a while to really build up. But I think in the long term, there will be a lot of demand for this type of you know, regulated product in the market. As much as you or me might not like it, you know, that is what big money looks for in terms of assurances before they start, you know, using a platform to sink money into something. Absolutely, Ben. I mean, that's where it's like they want to make sure that they're all their ducks are in a row. They don't like that, uh, you know, gray zone that we operate in. So, you know, they get these contracts, they'll be happy and satisfied. And then, you know, I think we'll start seeing, maybe we'll actually start seeing that ETF get approved because then there'll be more, you know, like you're saying, new spot prices and, you know, I guess uh, like what the SEC might consider better custody solutions. And, you know, I'm sure they are just considering the people involved. So I don't know. I mean, like for sure, this is definitely something to keep your eye on. I mean, this next month, I mean, I'm kind of looking at, the price going like i can't believe we're just sitting above 10 right now like with this news like i thought we were gonna shoot right back up but you know i mean these things play out like you're saying i mean it might not be a rush of volume right when they open and yeah we'll just have to see how it plays out we're still a month away but this certainly seems like good news for just bitcoin in general do you guys have any comment no para or janine I just want to say real quick, like I wouldn't look at this as like the sole way to trade. I mean, market wise, I think we're still up in the air in terms of which way things are going to go in the short to midterm. Yeah, I'm, I'm not Janine. saying be an oracle. So yeah, Janine and Nopar, y'all comment on backed contracts? Nope. <laughs> not interested huh <laughs> it's all right i think uh you know your next story kind of goes into something similar talking about basically big institution in bitcoin you want to lead us into what coinbase is up to yeah so uh in episode 185 um i talked about an article that covered some internal disagreements in the upper management of coinbase uh which resulted in a bunch of people leaving coinbase in the last year or so uh and one of those disagreements was about whether they should uh expand and focus on their institutional offerings and since they were apparently unable to handle that uh goal in-house they have recently announced that they have acquired zappo um if you've read my uh older blog post from 2017 titled don't fork with me uh you would know that zappo was one of the companies that participated in and then canceled the segwit 2x campaign uh the ceo of zappo is one of these six signatures or should i say names because some of these people don't even know how to use pgp uh yeah, so he had his name on the cancellation message for Sega 2X. Um, Zappo is also one of the companies that had pledged to provide technical and engineering support for Sega 2X and then clearly didn't. Um, so with that backstory in mind, uh, Coinbase announced on the 16th that uh, Coinbase Custody has completed an acquisition of Zappo's institutional businesses. This acquisition caps off a tremendous period of growth and innovation for Coinbase Custody. In just over one year since launch, Coinbase Custody has grown to over $7 billion in assets under custody, AUC, stored on behalf of more than 120 clients in 14 different countries, making it the largest, most globally recognized, and most trusted institutional custodian in the world. And they further say that Zappo has long been a pioneer in the storage of crypto assets, leading the industry in the creation of security techniques 
that have kept their customers' cryptocurrency safe since 2014. Yeah, just ignore the uh, gaping hole in their credibility that is Segwit2x and the fact that it took them forever to add Segwit, but whatever. And then on the same day uh, that this announcement of the acquisition was made, Coinbase uh, revealed an oopsie on their part, which is that about 3,400 customers had their passwords stored in clear text on Coinbase's AWS-based internal server log upon registration. Uh, and they have since fixed that problem and say that we triggered password reset for impacted customers, um, even though a password alone is not sufficient to access a Coinbase account. Our device verification emails and mandatory 2FA mechanisms would both have triggered and blocked any authorized login attempts. That is two stories there. <laughs> I know. Regarding it. But they're, they... <laughs> They go to they go together because Coinbase says they're the most trusted uh, custodian <laughs> in the world, and then on the same day they talk about a rather serious bug, and they call it rare. I mean, I don't know how many customers they have now, but three thousand four hundred people seems like a lot, especially if you're, you know, dealing. I mean, that that is the kind of problem that if you if that comes up in a custodian type situation where you're dealing with in, with institutions and large sums of money, you do not want that happening upon registration because that means you're storing the passwords to potentially millions of dollars in plain text. So I estimate we have about ten thousand uh, users. So. That would mean Coinbase would have a million or something like that. A anyway, uh, I I just want to clarify this because I went I glanced through the article and listened to what you just said, but it's not clear for me now. Coinbase acquires Zappo, the whole company, or just <clears throat> parts of it? It it uh. Yeah, well, it's actually not clear to me either because when I was re I, the the post makes it sounds like they're acquiring Zappo as a whole, uh, but I've seen some... it just says the institutional businesses, and then at the bottom it gives like it yeah it's kind of confusing because at the bottom it talks about Zappo the company as a whole. It doesn't really distinguish as like whether this is a subsidiary that they acquired or what. Like it, it's not very clear. I think I'm, they only acquired part of their operation. Yeah, I'm betting based on the institutional language, it's just part because their their main retail business is just like the the Bitcoin debit card and a wallet. And I don't like why would Coinbase buy that? They literally have both of those products themselves already. But this is where I was reading some stuff on Twitter where I think this was all just about acquiring Zappos like 122 contacts that, you know, custody with Zappo and like they for the most part keep their business. This is all just like kind of handing over who does custody with Zappo. But that was just like some hearsay on Twitter. I'm not 100% sure on that either. It's like Zappo is like. Oh shit, we have some legacy code, we should get rid of it, but there is so many people using it already. <laughs> so Coinbase, uh, just make Coinbase buy it. <laughs> I mean, honestly, like real long term though, I think like this situation is going to be a very interesting dynamic to pay attention to. And I think this is going to tell us just a lot about how this market develops over the next five or 10 years. Because I mean, like, think about it, the nature of just Bitcoin and, and just the, the, the finality in, in transacting it and just what that means in terms of theft. Like if you are a very high net worth individual who's storing Bitcoins with a custodian, like a, a situation like this should have your absolute utmost attention. Because now the, the person or the entity or, or company or procedures or whatever you put your trust in when you selected that custodian that's all up in the air because everything is changing hands right now. And the, any sane or responsible person managing large sums of Bitcoin that they hold with a custodian like this, who just like, like you should pay attention to this. This should be something that has your undivided attention and anybody custodian their money with Zappo who just 
treats this as a nothing or does not very deeply look into Coinbase beyond, oh, it's a big name, it's trustworthy, is an incredibly stupid person. And I think it's, you know, it's going to be interesting to tell. It makes no tell. sense, you know me. It, it makes a lot of sense. And it's going to be interesting to see whether we see a big shift in business or, or people using the service now that the owners are changing hands. But but we just established that that it's most likely just uh, they just acquire the parts of the whole and the yes the thing. the institutional custody part like the the part of the company that holds very very wealthy people's money yeah that's where it's like maybe there needs to be some sort of policy procedure when, with these big custody companies where it's like look if. There seems to be something coming down the line where we need to change over hands of ownership. Like here is the procedure we will take because right now it does seem like if I was one of those few people with money at Zappo and all of a sudden it's getting bought by Coinbase and, you know, it's like, okay, well, I'm going to go log into Coinbase and oops, there's a login error and now my login's been stolen. And I mean, like there's some real issues here. Like I'm seeing like what you're saying. I'm kind of picking that up. Beyond that, I'm just talking like pure trust. Like, I might trust you, but I might not trust Nopara. And if I store my Bitcoin with you and you sell all of that that company to Nopara, I'm pulling my money out. I don't trust him. Right. Like, you see what I mean? I like, don't that's care. Something... I got, your, I got yeah. your personal information anyway. <laughs> well, it's, it's relevant. But my point is, is like, this is something like big net worth individuals who use custodians like need to recognize and consider and pay attention to because it's a very serious issue. I mean, like, even just, like, jurisdictionally now, like, what kind of consequences does this have? Like, are Coinbase really? going to keep the same employees? Are they going to keep the same security procedures? Are they going to change any of this? Like, you know, this, this is all very serious questions that need exact answers very quickly. And, you know, is that going to be the case? Like, is, is are we at the point where people recognize the, the situation that the, the space creates the reality of it yet or are all of the people using this shit just completely clueless and not even aware of all of these dynamics as this business changes hands yeah not all but definitely a good bit and yeah i mean like this is something like you definitely have to pay attention to i mean like who what jurisdiction you're in with your custody i mean that's going to have some effects as far as like what that company's custody is like required to do from a regulatory standpoint to hold those bitcoins so yeah this is a big deal going forward i mean like uh you know like we're saying i mean not just like oh there's some issues between like just coinbase's code and everything but just the changeover of hands and you know the changeover of trust model and the you know, changeover of jurisdiction there's a lot changing over there where it's like i don't know how many of those people holding those how many people who have their bitcoins locked up in those uh multi-sig wallets are like okay i mean do they do they know it's no longer in that swiss mountain and that it's going over to california somewhere i mean what does that entail i mean you know like we're saying not everybody's up to speed on this stuff and yeah, I'd imagine there's a good bit out there that don't really recognize that there's all these issues coming down the line for them. But for first, yeah, because really wasn't... There are no issues. <laughs> what are you talking about? There's no issues, no para. You're cha- like the custodian is changing. The person who it... ho- controls your money is changing. That is a huge deal. Yeah, no, that's that's not. So, just the fact what? that Coinbase and Zappo was doing <laughs> the exact same thing, they have the exact same nature, and whoever trusts no. Zappo is probably uh, no, trusting no, Coinbase, ninety nine percent. I d- so okay. So for, for anyone who doesn't, percent... wait a second. It's, so for anyone who doesn't know, Zappo was primary offering, as far as I remember it, in terms of institutional clients was the whole swiss vault concept like so there's no detail as far as i can see about whether they're keeping that like there's no detail about what exactly was acquired within that institutional business are they they keeping the vault the whole thing set up or did they just acquire the clients or you know there's no detail really about what was transferred that's what's i mean if this 
was just a wallet, like a, a like a non-custodial wallet, then it probably wouldn't be that big of a deal. But when you're talking about businesses that have personally identifying information about people and, you know, like institutional clients can be even more sensitive than an ordinary consumer. Like there's a whole, there's a whole bunch of baggage with that. And if, if, you know, you're getting a person, that's like the, the standard of trust that you have to have with these people is so much higher. And so that, that's going to be tricky if, you know, a lot of that service is going to change as a result of the acquisition. Yeah, and also just like that basic logic is just like nonsense. That that's like saying like you know two people do the same job, so like the end result is identical because they do. It's no like one person can be a complete fucking incompetent idiot who can find a way to burn the building down just as a job with a janitor, and you can have somebody else who literally is so good and responsible at their job that they're the only reason that the place stays functional and clean. Like just like things being abstractly the same does not at all mean they're the same in specifics. When a company acquires another one and it's not for a reason that it's a competition, so we should just, just light up and, but it's, When they acquire another one, then the other company, they try to keep everything. They try to keep all the people working on them because they have the skills. They know the system that they built. So what? practically nothing is changing. Dude, no. Yes, it's it's not like everyone is fired from them. That's ridiculous. (laughs) Half the time that a company is bought, it's bought for specific pieces or subsections and everything else gets fucking ripped apart, sold, people fired. Like, no. Like, it is not the norm that when a company gets bought, it's just everything stays the same and no one gets fired. No. That is not how that works. And also, okay, like you, you you're moving example? farther and farther you an away. No, no, I have you're lot. moving farther and farther and farther away from the core point, which is that the person who controls your money is changing. It's not Johnny, your best friend, who's never done anything wrong in his life who holds your money. It's Steve, the guy you've never met before and don't know anything about. Like that is the core issue, and that is a huge deal. Yeah, I think no part is just having fun playing devil's advocate today. But like, you know, this is like, this is an incredibly significant event for any wealthy people who use services like this. And they need to recognize that things like this are significant events and learn to assess them and react to them. Or you're going to wind up with really screwy situations like people being worse at security and shit getting stolen or some jurisdictional difference meaning money that wouldn't have gets seized now like that's this this is something you need to pay attention to if you're a high net worth person absolutely man like you're saying i mean you know like we're saying and with the last story too i mean custody is a huge aspect of this and that's something that a lot of these regulatory companies are keeping their eyes on closely and you know out there in the west coast <laughs> there's a lot of rules with that not so many in switzerland so yeah i mean definitely this is something where yeah we should just sort of keep calling eyes to like companies like zappo and coinbase just you know they should they should have something on record as far as like a changeover of custody if that becomes the case like okay, just what but now you, you just tuned it down that well people have to pay attention to what is happening but before that you were talking about where well, the world is going to collapse now and everyone has to pay <laughs> out his money like <laughs> no again like no part no that is no. not at all what i said what i said was it's something you need to assess and consider whether you're going to do that Like you, you keep going farther and farther away from the point I'm trying to make. Uh, No, I I, I don't keep going farther away. I'm just saying that the point you are making now is something that I agree with. 
But that's the point not you the were point I'm making, making before. Now. That's the point I made. That's the only point I've made this whole time. Okay, then I think we have an agreement on that point. <laughs> All right. Then. So, yeah, big deal moving forward. I uh, think we about ran that one into the ground. So, yeah, Janine, why don't you take us into what else is going on with IOTA? Yeah, so in the last episode, I talked about some disturbing messages that an IOTA blogger had sent to Sarah Jamie Lewis. And around that time we were, um, around the time that we were recording the episode, that blogger actually published and unpublished two more. Uh, well, he hadn't originally written a blog post, he just DM'd her, but then he wrote two blog posts, uh, one of which, I, I'm not sure if he deleted the second one, but he deleted the first one after realizing that he sounded like a complete asshole. So I'm not going to read the entire thing, um, but there's a few portions that are particularly egregious. Uh, one of them, he basically says that the reason he sent her that message was to provoke her. He wasn't actually trying to blackmail her. And the second part is near the bottom where he says... My own business conduct is, I believe, quite certainly justified because it is aimed at a person who is not too sorry to share the vibrator on social media anyway, so this side blow or ha will hardly affect her, I assume. And then he links to a tweet where she shows a picture of a vibrator. Now, whether that's her vibrator, I don't know. Like, personally, it doesn't really matter anyway. But, you know, they, they keep bringing up this point that because she does security research on sex toys that that somehow means that she, it's justified to attack her. Okay, that makes no sense. Anyway, the, the it's our, it'll be archived in the show notes when you guys get access to that. Um, but then the second blog post was basic, uh, well, actually before that. So the reason he deleted it, at first he saw no problem with it. But then people pointed out, hey, uh, yeah, you should you should probably not do a personal attack like that. And then he said, how is pointing out her behavior a personal attack on my side? Honest question. I genu genuinely believe that she has a thick skin. She can cope with this. Again, it's like, really, dude, like there's no point bringing, bringing up that someone does security research on sex toys as being justification for that. And then... He tried to justify it by saying that she had committed what is considered slander in Germany. Uh, yeah, that's, again, not a justification for trying to blackmail someone, but whatever. But the um, when he eventually realized he sounded like an asshole, then he published a apology note where he says, Dear Sarah Iota Foundation and followers, this is a public apology. I apologize to everyone for the threats that I made there. Amy Lewis and the uh, med media, this should be media, media avalanche that grew out of it, especially to Sarah herself. Sorry, threats like that can't be justified with anything. This shed a very bad light on the IOTA community and the efforts of the IOTA Foundation. They are trying to solve some of the biggest issues the IOT brings with it, and they are pursuing a course of honest communication with and for the community in and outside of the IOTA realm. My approach was very questionable. Um, a very questionable attempt to force a public stage for factual discussion eh, that sadly never happened. This threat was merely a poker play, but not meant as a real threat. I don't intend to harm the reputation of honest working scientists that have the best intention, intentions, such as Sarah Jamie Lewis. I believe the cordicide, I think this has something to do with the coordinator, but it's like a weird term. The cordicide solution is not fully updated and fleshed out on paper, although it's in the heads of the IOTA Research Council, which makes it hard to reference factual evidence in a Twitter-based conversation. Don't, don't we all <laughs> agree with that part? <laughs> although I believe a conversation of all parties aside from Twitter would be beneficial, uh, deeply sorry for any harm that I caused, blah, blah, blah. My response was triggered by the allegations made on social media that the IOTA Foundation could possibly scam investors, believers, or the cause itself, which I cannot condone. And then he says he's going to be on a two-week break, blah, 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 blah. So, yeah, that's just an update. You know, this guy's just kind to trying to cover his tracks, not very successfully. Um, and these are, uh, even the ones he deleted are all archived. So, yeah, that's the end to that story. It only took a few day, a few days to take that down. He has screwed up and made quite a significant logical error in assuming a definitive possessive determiner of the noun dildo that did not exist. You fucked up, buddy.
<laughs> yeah, Is that a reference to someone? Security research on sex toys sounds really awesome. But aside that, uh, I think this is not uh, not the typical scammer behavior of issuing a public apology. Just think about Craig Wright. Uh, whatever he does, he's just doubling down on that. Uh, mm-hmm. Yeah, so I, I, I guess I, I give credit where credit is due. So, well, at least at least he did that. That's, that's certainly good direction, I guess. Hey, no part. You're a rapist. I'm sorry I falsely accused you of being <laughs> a rapist. Is it okay now? Because I apologize. Uh, you got wrecked when you made your apology, so I didn't hear it. <laughs> um, I said, um, no part is a rapist. And then I said, no way, you're not a rapist. Sorry I falsely accused you of being a rapist. Thank you for apologizing. <laughs> at least you did that. Like, yeah, I mean, like, you know, at least he <laughs> recognized the error of his ways and says he's going to take a two-week break and just figure out his style again. <laughs> I mean, like, this is the problem with foundations, right? I mean, they're run by people who are, you know, for you know, they're going to run into mistakes. They're going to do stupid things. They're going to say things they shouldn't. And now it's a you know, representation of your entire network. And so now IOTA looks like a giant joke. And I mean, this is not relegated to just IOTA. I mean, like these things have happened in other foundations, but they are relatively smart about staying quiet about those things and not like bolstering up and apologizing and saying like, that was something stupid I shouldn't have done or something. Because you guys know, I mean, people know. There's other stuff going on out there. Yeah, I mean, shit coins are going to shit and... and those people who, who who were really there for scamming, they already left, or uh, they they just lost the window of leaving. But uh, many people who who are still there, uh, maybe they believe that while well, there may be something behind this uh, futuristic, uh, uh, whatever grain farmers uh, are going to. You know what I mean? Just, just, just crazy ideas, moonshots. Uh, so I don't know. I, I just feel bad for this whole, whole iota community. Is there even Why? an iota community? I don't know. Why? The those who who la- who who are still still there, not those Why? who. Well, because they, they've had people explaining yeah. to them why this is all nonsense for years. They're idiots. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's my point. You can can feel bad for idiots too. <laughs> no, I just laugh at them. No, I get it. I mean, okay, okay. Here is an example. One coin. Uh, all all of us know one coin. Oh, That's man. a huge, huge scam. And there was a Hungarian YouTuber who started to, to to talk about one coin. And under the under the comment section, there was an old woman who was, oh, this is so great. Oh, thank you for for, and I invested in it and so on. And and I said and I and I told her that oh, well, be be more careful <laughs> that this is not going to end well, and it didn't end well. But I still feel bad for her even though her answer was like who are you well, he, yeah, he's she's, on youtube and she's he was talking <laughs> she's not one of the retards trying to pull the scam like fuck those people they're idiots you're talking about like clueless granny who doesn't know anything like that's not the same as the idiot who doesn't know anything but acts like he does to keep pumping his shit coin to everyone who will listen yeah, but if you're still there, because this whole thing collapsed already, at least to a degree, and if you're still there and still trying to to build and things on it, it just it just you're you're either very stupid because you know that it's not going to pump again, because you don't know it's not going to pump again, or you're you're just genuinely believing in something that's not true, right? So. And and now what? Which which is it? Because you you certainly put a lot of work into it, right? 
and it's it's not unbelievable that you they actually believe in what they are doing then they're idiots oh well well you get those guys that i get it you get some people caught up with some maybe like a missed assumption or something and they get wrapped up into it and they spend a lot of their time and effort in it and you get one of these guys that says something stupid at the top and now it's like you know, yeah, you're still kind of stuck with this idea of like, well, no, this can really solve a problem. And it's like, you know, but yeah, that's kind of just based on misassumptions. And so, you know, somebody will learn. It's just a, it's a bad effect of having leaders on your network. All right. So, yeah, let's see where we at now. I mean, we go from IOTA, one crazy nonsense story to another. Like, uh, Shinobi, you want to tell us what's going on with uh, Craig Wright nowadays? No, 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 um craig's motion um to dismiss things um under the argument that the federal government does not have subject matter jurisdiction and the reason for this kind of comes down uh mostly to this concept of um diverse jurisdiction so when a civil matter is being decided um you look at the citizenship of the people involved, and if it's a company, you look at the citizenship of the directors of the company. But the whole idea is that anything um, over a civil matter worth more than seventy-five grand, where people are from different states or jurisdictions, so like um, like different countries as well, uh, the federal government has jurisdiction. And so pretty much um, Craig has circled around all of his contradictory statements and forged evidence to try to argue that this diverse jurisdiction does not exist. And therefore, um, there, there is no jurisdiction in this matter with climate. And this is kind of strange because he has simultaneously... Um, or well, not simultaneously. At different times argued that he... Um, both has a role in um, the W and K company that Kleinman um, ran. Um, so it doesn't have a role, but then he does. Um, he knows who is involved in running the company and owns it, but he doesn't. And um, pretty, it's it's really confusing because, like, at some points he's said he doesn't have any clue who is on the directors board for W and K. But then at other times, he has attempted to claim that this uh, Nuygen woman and another Australian company are on um, the director's board of the company. But that would create the diverse jurisdiction. And so he's, he's kind of backpedaled and is now trying to argue he has no clue who owns anything. And pretty, pretty much like the, the judge just sifted through all of this evidence and all of his, his claims of um, – well, like one way or the other, that people are are not um, on the board of directors for this Florida company um, is just either based on things that have been proven fraudulent or things that are obviously fraudulent but not proven so, and just so circumstantial in their interpretation and contents that the, the, there is actually no definitive proof of anything. They are just claims, and so he has completely thrown out the argument that there is no jurisdiction here and outright noted multiple times in in this memo that he has pretty much like conflicted himself in statements multiple times like there, there is even a quote in this court document um from sir walter scott oh what a tangled web we weave when first we practice to deceive so um let's just say this is absolutely in no universe going to go well for craig i mean like he his attempt to dismiss this on the grounds of lack of jurisdiction is done and in the process of that being decided 
the the court is pretty much outright um like the judge is outright going like you've contradicted yourself so like the judge is outright acknowledging in in this order that he has pretty much committed perjury so th this is not going to go well for craig as this goes forward like this judge is wise to his shit and he's pretty much fucked looking at this wait he he tried to claim lack or lack of jurisdiction or lack of applicable jurisdiction when he's pursuing people left and right in the wrong jurisdictions. Yeah, like, he's, try, he's trying to argue because um, the whole thing is that if um, if the parties to the lawsuit, so like the the company and climate and shit, are all in Florida, then this has to get thrown out and go to a state court because federal doesn't have jurisdiction. But that like it's no like the the judge threw that out and has asserted jurisdiction and this is going forward oh yeah so it's uh sounds like it's still kind of a ridiculous situation over there and i don't know where, what are you thinking like how long is this going to play out how much longer is the courts going to deal with this but i mean you know courts go on they can drag on forever you think he's just going to keep trying to fight this Oh, we're in this jurisdiction or that jurisdiction, or the two jurisdictions going to be like, hey, he's telling you one thing and me the other, and we'll both throw this out, or you know, is that a possibility? Because this does seem like he's just trying to drag this thing out, and I don't know how much longer Jimmy's little head can take this thing. I wouldn't be shocked if this goes on for a year or two or more, or Craig <laughs> just like stops showing up to the proceedings. Dude, Jimmy is going to have a seizure at one of these events. Have you seen him? Like, I mean, like some of the videos I see, you know, from these like talks, it's like Jimmy's always got these little tweaks in his face from this whole situation. It's just stressing the hell out of these guys, except for, I don't know, I guess Craig is staying sufficiently uh, intoxicated enough to just sort of bumble through the whole process. But yeah, it seems ridiculous. I don't know if we'll get an answer anytime soon. Maybe uh, Peter McCormick and his... Uh, front over there in the United Kingdom will take some sort of effect and, you know, he'll shut it all down. But I don't know. Until then, this will probably drag out. Um, Craig is going to get wrecked based on this. And, like, frankly, McCormick didn't need to do shit and just stepped out to get attention for himself. And we all know that. I mean, come on. <laughs> well, you know, somebody's got to put this stuff on the book somewhere. Do you guys have Craig any more spending, coming? Yeah, oh, sorry. Craig is spending so many, so much time on court that he doesn't have time to to code on Bitcoin Satoshi's vision. <laughs> so that project is <laughs> there. You go. Here, here is your scapegoat. Here is your excuse why it's not going well. Right? He's spending so much time on this lawsuit or legal case that he doesn't have time to, you know, shake his finger at all the PhDs who are actually writing all of his papers. I feel so bad for them. Why? They're morons who got a job working for a scammer to just do shit for him to take credit for. It. They're idiots. Like, see, like, why? Like, I don't okay, think random knows. tangent. Yeah. Nobody feels yes, like yes, everybody. They are, no. Stop feeling bad for idiots. Nobody like feels bad. People like that deserve so, yes. what happens to them. I feel bad for you, Shinobi. <laughs> Shinobi. Shinobi, I don't actually feel bad for them. If I'm standing in front of them, I'd be like, "You need to leave right now. You're an idiot for working for this company at all. Just go. Stop complaining." Like, <laughs> I'm being sarcastic. And when I say I'm a Craig Wright fanboy, I, I don't really mean that, you know? Yeah. Everybody, every now and again, the trolls got to get trolled. All right. So speaking of trolling and all this stuff going on, let's go into this next one. Because uh, this thing's just got, you know, things are getting interesting on Twitter. So just a couple of days ago, the at Bitcoin account on Twitter has been making a lot more sense, and it looks like whoever owns that account is coming back around to BTC. We know, but for reference, after the UASF, Bcash, SegWit implementation, we were left with a few different narratives about Bitcoin, and the at Bitcoin account has always sided with the Bcash side of the equation. Until now, the account header has changed to show an image of an old wizard with, dragons, with a dragon standing behind him, snarling, and the bio reads, quote, 
Bitcoin is a peer-to-peer -peer magic internet money crafted by wizards and hodled by dragons. Don't trust, verify, attack our elodial money at your peril, close quote. And it looks like elodial is a word talking about land owned by someone absolutely, without any feudal obligations, held without acknowledgement of any superior. So this turnaround all started on August 20th with a couple of small trolley gifts. The first one was advertised as a ginormous announcement, and then the video showed the account holder go to their small list of followers and remove Justin's son from Tron with the words, make an announcement even if there's no nothing to announce, with the Tron logo saying, just make an announcement. <laughs> so, yeah, things are getting trolly there, and yeah, then they were talking about disinformation Easter eggs while they unfollowed regulated Bitcoiners that they were talking about is like those uh, Gemini exchange owners, the Winklevoss twins. And then uh, they also unfollowed Jahan Wu with a message about how the two networks are different and even retweeted Stop and Decrypt's video where Jahan Wu was getting upset off camera as people at the Hong Kong Bitcoin Summit referred to the network as Bcash and, and he was just yelling, it's not Bcash, it's Bitcoin Cash. So, um, yeah, now the account is following I'm only sorry. nine I'm people. sorry, Rick, I have, to, I have to correct you real quick. What? It's not Bcash! Bitcoin Cash! <laughs> We're in the mumble, man. I should actually pull that video out. We can just... But anyway, we'll do that next time. So, yeah, now the account's only following nine people. Number one is Bitcoin Mom. So, hey, congratulations, Brooke. That's pretty awesome. You got at Bitcoin account, the biggest Bitcoin account following you. That's great. Then uh, we have Dennis Parker, John Carvalho, Cobra, Peter McCormick, Jack Dorsey, Jameson Lopp, Jared Kenna, and the at BTC account. So all of this led to speculation about who owns the account and why the sudden change in opinion. Charlie Lee says it's someone romantically entangled with Roger Veer, except... Things turned sour and they must have broken up. Well, on Reddit, Roger did reply to a thread asking, is there anything we could do to save at Bitcoin? Where he just simply said, don't know. So, yeah, that's what's going on. What do you guys think about this? you have any speculation about this at Bitcoin Twitter account or what is going on here in the past few days? Um, I don't buy the bullshit. Um, it's still Roger. Like, when are you forking? Like, come on. Like, when are you forking, and are you going to fork off of Bcash again, or, or fork off Bitcoin again? Like, come on. No, yeah, no, no I, uh, it is, This changed, and again, because this is not the first time. The first time uh, this happened when, I don't know, a lot of us reported the Bitcoin account uh, back then, like half a year ago, a year ago or something, and then the very first person who so it, it got it got kicked out of Twitter and the very first person who 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 registered that account then he, he got the Bitcoin account. Now how it get transferred back to the original Bitcoin Cash uh, owner I don't know but maybe it's the exact same thing that's happening now but hopefully it's not going to be transferred back. I mean, it wouldn't make any sense that the Bitcoin Cash guy suddenly starts to, to, to do things like this. Maybe it's just someone at Twitter. Uh, Jack doesn't even know about it. <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it's just someone at Twitter like, ha, ah, this Bitcoin account is not, not cool. Let's spend it and I'm going to take his place. Maybe, maybe like Stark that, you know? came up like, oh, hey, Jack. That's where yeah, there's some speculation. <laughs> there's some speculation. Well, not just about that ridiculous story, but there is speculation that it's like Twitter behind the scenes. They're like, look, this Bitcoin account is trouble. But I also wouldn't be surprised if like you're saying, if there is actual, you know, further infighting within the Bcash network and they're just like, hey, you know, this thing ain't working and we need to figure out what to do. And so they're trying their next move. Yeah, I don't know if it's in the news desk yet, but uh, Roger Ver was step step down. I, I don't know if he stepped down, but uh, someone else is now the Bitcoin.org CEO and not Roger Ver. And well, what you can see already that Bitcoin.org is starting to remove the Bcash propaganda. So there is some good tendency there too. Yeah, well, I mean, it's like, at this point, 
Like, Roger has to be going fucking broke. I mean, if you take him at his word that he did move a sizable amount of his Bitcoin into Bcash, like, has been diversified into all of these shit coins that are crashing like a rock, like, spending all of this money and resources, like, doing all of this scammy Bcash shit, I mean, he's got to be running out of money. And, like, he, he couldn't keep that going forever. You know what I mean? I mean, I wouldn't take Roger at his word, but I would be willing to say that he's stupid enough to have done that, so. Yeah, but it's my point is, like, I see, like, I don't know, if you, like, honestly, I really don't care about this shit with the Bitcoin account, but if you think you want to take on it, like, I look at, like, all of this shit happening simultaneously, I just see Roger losing all of his assets because he's going broke. Because he's just pissing his money away on a scam that nobody's buying. Yeah, I just kind of hope he like fades. He fades into the mist and goes away, and we never have to hear from him again. He he kind of already did, didn't he? I mean, I don't. I didn't hear from him for a very long time, and it's probably because I'm not visiting those channels, but. Those channels are not even triggering through to my, you know, to, to, to whatever I'm looking at. He just, he just, he's just not, not a player anymore in the Bitcoin field. At least not, not as significant as he was. Yeah, I think everybody stopped taking him seriously the minute he just continued on with this debate me on the block size and this like lightning doesn't work. And it's just like, look, there's engineers saying you know that are verifying a lot of this stuff and you're just still running with this and yeah i mean i don't know i mean i think you're right i think he definitely is losing a lot of money and he's got to sell some assets and maybe this at bitcoin account was one of them and you know there it goes and now it's in the hand of somebody with some btc in their pocket so that's a good thing either way it seems like it's a good thing for bitcoin right it's all good news for bitcoin yeah, I mean, and important too, the Bitcoin account on Twitter and the Bitcoin.org. The, the, these, are, these are something that at least look official, right? So a lot of people will get tricked by them. So, so it, it's important. We just don't care because we, we like, well, we can't do anything about it. They hijacked the both of that uh, important uh, domains and but it's important. It just, yeah. Yeah, I think it was. Let's move uh, on to the next topic. Well, just first, I'm just going to give a shout out to Error Log again for really just wrecking Roger. I think that I think that was the debate that did it when he lost his cool there. Yep, good job. All right, yeah. So, what is the next one? It looks like uh, Janine, you're going to tell us something about BitPay and what all they're talking about. You need to do nowadays. Yeah, I mean, in in an absolutely, completely unanticipated move, um, BitPay, who is probably the only implementer of the atrocious BIP70, is adding KYC requirements for people who purchase cryptocurrency through their service. Um, And there's a few caveats to who gets KYC and who doesn't, but basically in their blog post they write, we have now added a dashboard for shoppers, um, when paying BitPay merchants or accessing other tools, BitPay provides for life and work on crypto. Importantly, with verified BitPay IDs, which they weirdly compare to Apple IDs, I don't know if they're equivalent though, um, will uh, be able to better mitigate risk in line with our identity verification me- measures here at BitPay. We are introducing a new identity verification flow for purchasers requesting refunds of $1,000 or more. Um, for people receiving BitPay payouts or for purchasers paying uh, a 3000 or more to BitPay merchants um, or loading via a BitPay prepaid product. If you're requesting a refund of $1,000 or more, uh, receiving a payout from a business using BitPay's payouts API or making a $3,000 payment, you will notice one of these screens asking you to verify some details about your identity and location that basically asks for your name and your address and all of that. So this one-time verification will take you through a quick process of providing identity information such as social security number or passport number for non-U.S. residents. So this includes U.S. and non-U.S. people. 
and a picture or scan of a photo ID. This process helps us improve our identity verification efforts and reduce payment risk for BitPay's merchants. Actually, it just reduces your regulatory risk, not risk for merchants, because collecting identifying information is a risk. Uh, do I have to repeat that? Uh, it's also a requirement for us to be able to offer verified users feature services like Bitcoin payouts or faster onboarding for people who want to get uh, BitPay prepaid products. The one-time verification requirement is for people making BitPay merchant uh, or prepaid payments of through th So this is basically repeating itself. Um, blah, blah, blah. Importantly, at the very end, uh, they claim that person-to-person -person payments with BitPay's uh, app and the copay app aren't included and do not require id verification well that's great yeah so i guess we're taking the peer-to-peer -peer part out of merchant stuff which was supposed to be what bitcoin did i guess not yeah bitcoin was supposed to make this all peer-to-peer -peer, but we've decided we want to make some parts peer-to-peer -peer and some parts not peer-to-peer -peer. i guess that's what they're doing so yeah I did not see this coming whatsoever. Like, who could have guessed that they would do this? Not me. <laughs> oh, BitPay, BitPay, BitPay. Yeah, that's like one of the ones that fell real far. I mean, I remember first getting my BitPay card thinking like, okay, I could now do this Bitcoin thing. And now it's just like, they're not even involved with this stuff at all other than just, yeah. This is the practice you're not supposed to be encouraging. Yeah, I mean, it's because a Linux guru wrote it pay. <laughs> I mean, it's not mm -hmm. really that shocking. Like, if you look at legacy payment systems, like by default, just making a payment, they automatically do all this KYC stuff. So it's like you're already deviating from compliance standards just with how Bitcoin works. Oh, and I just Should want we... to point out um, BitPay was another one of the companies that pledged to provide technical and engineering support to Segwit2x. And let's see what else they did. Um, oh, yeah, a BitPay software engineer. Um, changed had changed the dns seeds um i think this was in bitcoin core or it was for the segwit 2x fork code but they changed the dns seeds to ones that were provided by bitpay ob1 blockchain.info and block which was running a surveillance uh blockchain analysis thing what else did they do they lied and made oh a yeah they were trying uh, to trick people into upgrading to two uh, X nodes and just make it seem like a standard yep. segwit upgrade. Yep, I was getting to that, and they did. They also didn't issue a follow up warning that the code was unsafe once it clearly was shown to be unsafe. Um, yeah, so lots of interesting things. Yeah, there, there was a famous off by Van Air or by Jeff Garzik on the Segwit 2x uh, thingy too. Absolutely. So, yeah, I mean, I don't know. Like we're saying, they've, they've gone a long way from where they are. But, you know, it's good to see some other people took up the mantle. And, I mean, like we've been seeing people run with, uh, you know, this uh, BTC pay server, just like open source it and run with it, right? Well, you see, you know, this is what happens when you give too much power into the hands of a Linux developer, right, Shinobi? No, that's retarded. But before we go on to that, though, like, this is, like, this is just, like, what has been coming inevitably since these companies really started showing where their head's at. I mean, you as a business either adapt to Bitcoin or you fail. Like, there is no making Bitcoin adapt to you. And, like, all of these companies, like BitPay, fucking, like, Zappo, Coinbase, all of them tried to make Bitcoin adapt to them. And, like, now we're just really seeing, like, that decay kick in where it's like, okay, how are you going to keep a viable business going um, when you haven't learned the lesson um, adapt to Bitcoin yet? All right, so with that, I move on to the next story, which is about BitPay2 or, or more 
about BTC Pay's two years anniversary. <clears throat> BTC Pay was what what was the story there? Nicola Dori, who is an Bitcoin developer who created an Bitcoin library for .NET, everyone's using that. He he was a huge BitPay fanboy actually, and I I remember I was reading his uh, his tutorials and things like that, and 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 everywhere when when there was some some wallet interaction or where should you create a wallet or something like that, it was always like copay or bit. So so he was a very very bit pay user <laughs> that's for sure and then in 2017 uh, August 18 he bitpay published an article about <clears throat> what bitcoin users need to know uh, to be ready for segwit activation and uh, this is full of shit and nicolas tweeted that this is lies my trust is my trust in you is broken i will make you obsolete so and this got uh, 1300 likes and this got nicolas to write BC, btc pay which is a decentralized alternative of bitpay because at that point bitpay was the only only thing that provided merchant services uh, also coinbase but BitPay was the dominant one, and 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 he created BTC Pay. This is how BTC Pay started. So before I go into the actual story, I'd like to ask you because I was wondering it, wondering about it for a very long time, and you are native English speaker. So he he tweeted that this is lies. Is that is that correct grammar there? This is lies. Do you say that? Yeah, these are lies is what um, it should be. Yeah. All right. Thanks for the clarification. So and now Nicholas created a blog post that's called This is lies. You are obsolete. <clears throat> so what's in this? Two years have now passed since the infamous tweet that encouraged me to write the first line of code for BTC Pay server. I blamed Bitcoin Core for not having a good enough API to handle the most common scenarios that the industry needed at the time. As a result of this, the void was filled by third-party providers such as Blockchain Info, BitPay and BlockCypher. All these services were delivering real value by making it easy to build your own service on top of Bitcoin. Anyone who tried to use Bitcoin Core API and who did not really care about decentralization would not take any second thought about using easier centralized alternative. I don't believe anymore that Bitcoin Core should be to blame to either. Bitcoin Core should be as minimalist as possible as it is very costly to make any changes due to the amount of review it requires. I think Bitcoin Core should focus on providing access to its internals of anything that is hard to get right, such as mempool state and validation. BitPay was, in my mind, the number one threat to security of Bitcoin at the time uh, of Segwit2x. I am proud to say today that this threat is no longer present. BitPay itself ended up focusing their efforts trying to appeal to any business which does not really have skin in the game for Bitcoin. If BitPay were to attempt an attack on Bitcoin network today, we should simply shrug at it. So yeah, th this this wasn't the whole blog post, this was just my my selections from that, but I think there is a lot of lot of wisdom in there, and uh, and and I agree with like everything what he just said there. So, so 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 that was it. Any opinions on that, or should we move on to the next topic? Well, I mean, like uh, first off, I like the fact that he says this is lies. My trust is broken in you. I mean, you know, the way it's worded is somehow you know it's like built character into it and i mean like it is historic i mean like what's happened in the past two years is huge and i mean like coming from that last story talking about bitpay and 
what all they're doing nowadays and you can see BTC pay server and how far that's come in the same two years. It's a, uh, you know, yeah, that's a pretty drastic comparison. And so, yeah, Nicholas Dorier, you know, really congratulations on that two year mark. And, you know, it's really good to see, you know, just another moment we can kind of celebrate with Bitcoin and their history of Bitcoin. All right. Was, did you guys have anything, Shinobi or Janine? I'm I'm just a little creeped up by the uh the handle Shinobis Toiletis. When did that appear? <laughs> uh pretty early in the show. I think that might be Booger Guy. I don't know. But yeah, shout out to Audio Tweaker for making it into the mumble today. We've actually got a pretty good little crowd in the mumble and, and we're jo- enjoying the chat in the troll box here. So Oh no. If what? They left. He go. Oh, he you left. see? Where did he, he brought go? brought it to his attention, That's and now me, he's out of here. Doofus. When I oh. have to go somewhere, I, oh. I I have a bunch of fucking cat hair in my eye. I, I go wander off. No, oh my God. Of course it's Shinobi with all the bots. Okay. So, last story I covered. Uh, well, this yeah, this this last story we just talked about. There was a uh, a tweet that came out where it was all the guys holding Nicholas Dorier's tweet uh, on a big board and everybody was pointing at it saying like congratulations that was from this bit block boom conference in uh texas and you know some more uh, some other things came out of that conference that uh, i was going to cover so last story i talked about we were talking on the at bitcoin account causing a ruckus all over twitter this past week well the account that account retweeted uh, someone else causing a huge ruckus this past week and uh, that's bitstein and his recent Ted style talk that he gave at that big block boom conference in Dallas. His presentation had a lot of hype around from that opening slide and the title saying, quote, how to meme Bitcoin to the moon, where he covered advanced geopolitical meme craft. He goes into details about how these memes are very powerful and they're making their way into the public record with the recent Senate and congressional congressional hearings on the topic. Like when one of the representatives was talking about shitcoins, and now shitcoins is in the public record. So there is a serious topic here to talk about, but it's layered in memes, and that can get trolly, which is by design. Michael goes into the discussion point of knowing when to troll based on the forum and participants in the discussion. He talks about Aristotle's views on communication, on rhetoric versus dialect methods, and how that can be effective. He says, and I agree, that uh, we should argue amongst ourselves in the in-group of Bitcoiners while trolling the out-group of no-coiners and multi-coiners. The arguing from within the group helps us get stronger while trolling of the out-group allows others to watch the discussion to draw conclusions based on the argument. This is exactly what I was doing in 2015 and early 2016 before I decided to say a word on Twitter. I just watched people's discussions and arguments to which I would draw my own conclusions. Some other great points brought up in Michael's presentation were about time preference and how other Bitcoin propaganda establishments like this show should always be bullish. ABB. Always be bullish. I think that's a uh, play on that that famous line, always be closing. So always be bullish. Um, Anyway, so another... And he also says uh, we should be relentlessly positive because all news for Bitcoin is good news. There's no bad news for Bitcoin. This presentation was very interesting to the crowd and someone typed up a transcript of the speech and posted it to Twitter. Naturally, this caused a lot of the community to get really hurt when they heard phrases like, no coiners must be crushed without seeing the context of the speech. They just grabbed the offensive language they wanted to present as toxic maximalism. The two most offended was Ryan Sean Adams and Ari Paul, whose delicate petals were brushed the wrong way with this transcript. They took to Twitter and started spewing out discussions on how toxic Bitcoiners are. And in the current market climate where altcoins have recently decoupled from Bitcoin, costing their investors billions, well, you don't want to mess with Bitcoiners. Udi took this point and ran center stage with it, tweeting, quote, It's time for the ETH gang to wake up, smell the ashes, and take some responsibility. 
Their 2017 blockchain everything narrative failed miserably and cost retail investors billions. Dumped into scams supported by ETH naivety. We are toxic? How dare you? Where's your postmortem? Close quote. Now the discussion has been reframed for these multi-coiners to try and prove Ethereum has done anything useful since its inception other than destroy billions of dollars. These, these were also part of Bitcoin's uh, Bitstein's presentation when discussing framing the arguments. This was also part of the presentation where he discussed framing the arguments. He also says... Memes work best in trigrams, three words that get the point across and build a strong mental model. Now, with all the responses from Ethereum developers and investors, Udi just keeps responding, more bad takes. So, it's working. It's, gener it's, uh, it's genius at, it's genius that, uh, wait a minute, what? Sorry. Bitstein's presentation was pretty genius. It has a, it had a big effect on Twitter discussions leading right up to this ETH Berlin that's coming up where Udi will be present. So it's going to be, I'm sure that's going to be an interesting conference. And I'm sure we're going to continue to see people try and explain to Udi like what uh, what exactly this network has done for people. So yeah, did you guys catch any of that uh, that transcript or the blowback on Twitter? What did you guys think about you know how to meme Bitcoin to the moon? I mean, I don't know. I kind of see the reaction to this as being similar to the reaction that particularly Ethereum people had to Giacomo Zucco's talk last, I think that was last year or something. Um, I mean, yeah, if you read it face value without understanding the context, it sounds pretty shitty uh, and kind of, yeah. I mean, I don't, I don't agree with just attacking anyone who doesn't own Bitcoin because that seems weird. And I mean, I don't, it's just not something that I do. And I've realized, like, you know, we'll get to it later. But working on this wallet recovery thing, there's like so much documentation that needs to be written. And I just, yeah, there's like so many little debates going on about what did someone say and what did they actually mean and blah blah the thing that i did find really funny though with the responses was that people were saying that like he was bitstein was advocating for like being a tyrant and then vitalik was responding no i definitely didn't get into this to support tyrants which is great because that discussion has been going on slightly today um where, you know, the big elephant in the room in Ethereum is the fact that both Consensus and the Ethereum Foundation are trying to get investment from Saudi Arabia. And I mean Jesus. Russia as well, but that's kind of predictable that's kind of predictable. Um, you know. But like Saudi Arabia really like I mean, come on, like they they literally I can't remember what his position was, but the guy's name is Virgil Griffith and he works for the Ethereum Foundation. And uh, coincidentally, he was um, I mean, I know we have uh, qualms with the Tor project, but he was kicked out of the Tor project uh, for uh, let's just say improperly using his analysis tools and possibly selling data to you know governments who might abuse that so that was never clarified but that's why he's kicked out and so it doesn't really surprise me that he's now become head of i don't know projects or something at ethereum foundation and he thinks it would be a good idea if if the saudi government invested a trillion dollars into ethereum so yeah if that's the kind of like group or state or whatever you want to call it if that's the kind of group that they're looking to cozy up with yeah i mean that's see the differences with bitstein speech is that that's just a talk like there is no actual money or power behind that speech it would just be the individual choices of how people want to interact with each other but when you're talking about taking money from a state that is first of all like one of the things i pointed out is that you know consensus is working with um i don't know which parts of the government exactly beyond the telecom uh part but 
I mean, consensus is basically working with people with a state that if a if a section of their employees were to actually go to the kingdom and live there and work there, they would be at risk uh, for various reasons, whether, you know, a religious reasons or sexuality reasons. There's a bunch of ways in which they would probably be imprisoned or killed. So, yeah, that's weird. So, like, when we're talking about tyrants... Like we should make a, we should distinguish between that person on Twitter who made you feel sad or angry and, you know, the entire government that lords over millions of people and actually executes people, you know, for not being religious or being of the wrong religion or having the wrong sexuality. So. Jeez, stop being such a tyrant, Jeanine, and telling me how I can use the word tyrant. Oh, you guys are tyrannical in your vocabulary. Yeah, I mean, like, honestly, yeah, I mean, there's just definitely a lot going on from that just from that talk where it's like, you know, yeah, you have foundation members from Ethereum and, you know, just a big chunk of the Ethereum community now getting riled up by Udi. But like, uh, you know, yeah, it's just a lot of, yeah, people just grabbing what they wanted and just sort of interpreting it because whenever he was saying things like no coiners must be crushed, it was explained where Bitstein tweeted out of Paul Krugman like walking around in this ridiculous looking cycling gear, you know, it's like his little small legs and his little, you know, glasses and his bike helmet on looking like a dork. And he's like, you know, this is the guys that need to be crushed. It's people that are actively supporting these uh this tyrannical fiat system and the way that it has destroyed people's value and destroyed people's lives and like they shouldn't be treated with any sort of level of respect or like that they should be part of the conversation and so whenever he was saying that no coiners must be crushed part of it it was absolutely directed towards guys like rabini and krugman and jamie diamond and guys like that not like people that didn't own it but you, you know what is, you know what is for this this what you just said that no coiners must be crushed. That there is, there are two meanings. People differently interpret what no coiners mean. How I interpret it is that no coiners is someone who doesn't have Bitcoin. But how he from his context how he, he interpreted it, no coiners are those who are actively speaking up against Bitcoin publicly, right? So and. Now what what's going on on Twitter? Well, you no know, coiners are now everyone who doesn't have Bitcoin and they must be crushed. <laughs> <laughs> this is where we need best practices on our vocabulary because he calls those people pre-coiners. So anybody that's never owned Bitcoin is a pre-coiner. People that actively you know stand against it because of the you know they want to keep this current system moving forward. Those are the no coiners. And then there's the multi-coiners, and you know yeah, there's some. There's definitely some nuance in here and we definitely should probably come up with some sort of terminology that works for everyone because yeah just the the way it all came out and people just reading the lines of it and not seeing like you know his slideshow and the way that he's joking around about some of this stuff people definitely ran with it shinobi i can't believe you don't have anything to say about people trolling all over twitter and trolley presentations well, I don't see it. As I think a he's still trying to get the cat hair out. <laughs> we can hear you, dude. What do you got to say? I don't see it as a trolley presentation. No, I mean, like I'm saying, it it made sense. I mean, like it is an interesting way of communication because, like, you know, it's basically like the way kind of like science works as far as like people come together and they talk amongst themselves in the in group and there's people watching these discussions and they come to their own conclusions but whenever you put it all on twitter and the internet and you throw money all wrapped up into it it it's different man it's like uh it's different and i'm glad that you know somebody like you know yeah bitstein's out there explaining it and like the relevance of it and why it's important and yeah it wasn't really trolley it's just like it's a presentation wrapped in memes so some people will get offended yep and i mean as far as like the eat shit i mean it's just like you know their, their whole attitude on flipping it back like i don't call that controlling the narrative i call that reflecting reality 
because that's reality. And like, especially the shit going on with Saudi Arabia, I've actually like talked to people who work on projects like out in Saudi Arabia on this blockchain shit. And they're just scamming the government's blind out there because they have no fucking clue what the hell is going on. They just hear fancy promises, throw money at shit. And then engineers like this guy I've talked to get told to build a bunch of pipe dream crazy nonsense that's impossible. Like, that's what's going on right now. Like, it's just scammers mining fucking oil money. Ooh, that sounds like some high-risk stuff. I mean, you know, yeah, some people get stuck in a situation and they just keep going down the road because they don't know which way to go. I mean, yeah, that sounds bad. No, I mean, for for the engineers, it's extremely low risk because if they fuck it up, like if they implement, I don't know, some kind of blockchain and you, God forbid any citizens in Saudi Arabia have to use it, if they fuck something up, they can just leave the country. And they'll be like, look, Saudi Arabia is oppressing its citizens. It's like, yeah, you built the system that allowed them to do that, you idiots. Like, it's extremely low risk for them. It's high risk for everyone who's going to be subjected to whatever the government decides to implement. I guess. I'm just like thinking it's high risk on, yeah, if you try to get out of there, you know, and you did something where you're scamming like uh, Saudi princes out of money and, um, you know, they find out about it and you're in the country. Off with your head, man. Yeah, but it's just, you know, it's, uh, it's just overall, I think it's a nice thing to see. And especially it punches harder with like what's going on with the markets right now. Because I'm just like sick of all this insane delusional shit where it's like Bitcoin is a scam. Bitcoiners are scams, like all this. Pe and, and then they're literally out there running Ponzi schemes sucking billions of dollars out of clueless investors while they're calling us scammers it's like no <laughs> yeah that's where it's like man had to bring this stuff up on the show it's been dominating on twitter and yeah it's probably gonna you know they're gonna be keep talking about it because i mean like we're seeing some market realities right now as far as just uh you know people and price and what all they're thinking and you know yeah stuff is there's some realities coming around. All right, dude, you want to take us into a reality where you can actually trust your binaries? Nope, 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 nope. nope <laughs> this nope, is nope. something I got excited uh -uh. about. Uh-uh, uh-uh, nope, nope, nope. Can we still not trust them? All right. All right, so everybody who is familiar with Bitcoin should be familiar with Gideon. And the whole idea behind Gideon is that you can compile software in a virtual machine um, that has a standard like specification, variable settings, like version, so on and so on. And the, the process is effectively just compiling everything and like going through and hashing the entire process guaranteeing that each step of the way you are getting the the same results until you arrive at a final hash to to verify and the idea is that all of the bitcoin developers and anybody who wants to contribute um can reproduce this build and guarantee that like this binary hash that everybody is downloading matches this version of source code and pretty much the the problem with that is um, beyond it being a giant pain in the ass is it's just blindly trusting ubuntu like that that is all being done with just a blind downloaded ubuntu binary that's never been audited like the tool chains and everything and ever and it's just like that's a big glaring hole and so this new guix thing like what what guix is is effectively a package manager for Linux distributions um, that kind of have a Gideon-like thing just built into how it downloads and installs packages to verify them. And this has been integrated into Bitcoin Core by um, Carl Dong from Chaincode Labs. 
And effectively, the state of things right now is that instead of blindly trusting um, the Ubuntu binaries in the Gideon process, um, you actually can go through using this new GUX, um, GUIX method to bootstrap and kind of in a Gideon-like way verify the entire tool chain that's going to be used to compile uh, Bitcoin Core. And so like this is also something that, you know, just as time goes on, you know, like I said, this is pretty much a general package manager for Linux that can verify things kind of like Gideon does. And the, the gist of this in the long term is this is pretty much going to phase out and replace um, Gideon as a way to have this kind of reproducible builds to verify um, and have a lot higher of a degree of trust in, in binaries uh you know going forward and ultimately like i think like the the core of this is it's removing the huge central trust on ubuntu which is a, a huge thing going forward because you know you might not think about it you might think oh it's ubuntu that's okay but that doesn't cut it if you're talking a hyper bitcoinized world with everything running on bitcoin like that's a central point of attack somebody will try to attack it so just remove it. Well, I, yeah, I mean, like, this is where I got excited about this because, yeah, I remember setting back up, setting my note up uh, for the first time in early 2017, you know, right about the beginning of UASF and everything. Like, uh, I got everything spun up on my Ubuntu system, and it was like uh, once I got everything and – verified by outputs and i was like finally like i'm using bitcoin and hacknix was like but did you compile your compiler and i was just like what and i mean like that's where it was like oh you got to even trust your compiler and the way that it's compiled and you know so you know just like anything that we can do to you know build out that trust model to where it's more strong and you know we don't have to trust one particular system it's a good thing so yeah it's good to see that this uh you know, that you can compile this in a variety of environments and see how everything comes together. It's, it's a good thing to see. I'm, I'm happy that it, it's getting, as far as I understand, uh, easier, uh, what you just said, to do these reproducible builds, because when I did the reproducible build set up for Wasabi, I'm like, Oh man, but still, there, there, there is just there is just software that you rely on. So, yeah, it's it's reproducible that it's coming from the same source, but you still use this software and this software and this software. So, uh, well, I mean, yeah, you reproduce it, but there are still so many so many factors that that that's not that deterministic, even though it it should be somehow. No para if. The cypherpunks have their way. Um, so we will go back to a bootstrapped fucking compiler from scratch and then rebuild everything from there to not be completely fucked. <laughs> and then, and then, just... and then we'll have nice arguments over over you know compiler vulnerabilities. <laughs> yeah, but there are millions of programming languages, so. So, so you know, like you, you want to rewrite all the compilers, or, or I don't know if it, it's not working. Start with we, which actually. C. Yeah, go good. Terry has given us Holy C and the Temple. From there, we must build. So this actually brings something to to something that I was thinking about. And, and this will be my final thought, uh, even though it's not final. Thought, <laughs> <I mean. laughs> okay, well, no. <laughs> but but it's on topic. <laughs> okay, then. So, fine. <laughs> so the thing is that uh, why do we have so many programming languages, and why isn't one programming language dominates? Like that's how how, how competition works, and. If there is free competition uh, among programming languages, just they, they, they compete. There is just no legislation and regulation and all kind of shit. That's, 
simply free market and this should be gravitating towards monopoly or something like that but but it doesn't there are just so um, many programming languages what do you mean it doesn't? kind of equally used what do you yeah? mean it doesn't like anything that matters is like written in like fucking c or c plus plus and like maybe nowadays like creeping out into other things like go and like c c sharp is pretty big but it's like yeah, there are like a handful of languages that like most important shit is done in. I mean, Python, Java, C sharp, Node JS, C, C plus plus. These are C dominates embedded systems. Okay, wow, but there isn't just a programming language that dominates all. Like, and my my thinking was. It's mic. still too early. Yes? Oh no, your mic got quiet for a second. Oh, okay. So my thinking was, it is because it's still too early. There is still too many things, so many things to build with programming languages. So they have to evolve. And, and so Fine. this brings me back to Bitcoin that, well, when will we see Bitcoin dominance, like like crazy Bitcoin dominance? Because that's kind of what we want to see. But what does that have to do with Bitcoin binary? <laughs> yeah, but that's that not is not good on because... topic. Done. No more. <laughs> Ending comment. Bad yes. No okay. <laughs> but okay, let me finish it with this: that if we see. A Bitcoin dominance or any altcoin dominance, like like a complete dominance, then that kind of means there isn't just too many things to invent here anymore, right? Because just just the shit coins are not popping up anymore, and there's just no problems to solve, right? So maybe the cryptocurrency no, no, ecosystem done. is done. not as innovative done. as we this would like done. to think. <laughs> this has nothing to do with GUIX and reproducible builds at all. Comment done. Janine, Rick, do you have anything to say that's actually about this topic? I like that we can compile this stuff in different environments as well. But yeah, there's a lot of different languages too. Yeah, but you know, it's like, you know, to go back to like what Nopara said that kind of was on topic before he went off the deep end, like it, with uh, programming languages and just it being too early for things to solidify. Like, I think that's just the state of computing in general. I think that fundamentally, you know, 100 years from now, two years from now, or 200 years from now, like the, the model of computing that people are used to is going to be like wildly different. Like just to how software interacts with the hardware layer different just the model of like data access and management i think will be different like i think there's a big potential like just basic networking protocols could be completely different and like you know bitcoin has to survive and thrive and stay secure and auditable and solid through that whole shifting landscape like bitcoin has to be a rock in this ever-evolving like universe of computing models that exist now and what will exist later and it's like you know what i mean like it, it has to be a rock while it's like floating in the middle of quicksand like it has to be solid and steady like that's <clears throat> that's going to be a very challenging step-by-step -step thing Yeah, I mean, that's where it's like Bitcoin is, I mean, it is the rock, but I mean, like you're saying, I mean, there is something, some things that, I mean, like, you know, this next story, I mean, you're going to tell us, right? I mean, there's like this new language that can kind of script stuff with Bitcoin where it's a little bit easier to script some things. I mean, you know, yeah. it, it's becoming a little bit more like, you know, the rock is there and we know how to play with it. I mean, we did like, you know, people are saying, I'll let you go into it. Tell us all about Miniscript, man. Well, it's something that Andrew Polstra 
and uh, Peter Wola have been working on for, I want to say like a year or more now, but they've actually put a site out <clears throat> with some, um, you know, concept implementations. I think right now they have um, a C++ compiler for it, <clears throat> a Bitcoin Core um, implementation that's compatible with it, as well as an implementation of Miniscript and Rust. And pretty much the idea of it is it's just like a high-level language <clears throat> for um, a subset of Bitcoin scripts. And so it's like, you know, you have Python, like you run that through the interpreter that compiles it down to machine code and then it runs on the CPU. Like this is <clears throat> just the higher level language for Bitcoin script. Like instead of actually having to work directly with like an assembly like stack language to do scripts, you can do something that works like Python and then just compiles down into the actual script. And, you know, the nice thing about this is <clears throat> like you can... You know, aside from just things being more dynamic and um, compatible, like you can do a lot of simpler things like reason or analyze um, a script in these higher level languages or like analyze like the cost to spend it different ways if there's different ways to spend it <clears throat> or like make sure that, that there's no way that this script could be spent in a way that it shouldn't. And, you know, on top of all of these things, like it's going to make it a lot easier for wallets to be able to interact with different things. Like if your wallet doesn't know how to spend a certain output, you import a mini script for that. And then it can just <clears throat> analyze and know how to deal with that. Like if your wallet doesn't like uh, let you do uh, a multi-sig with a time lock too, well, you just write the mini script for it and import it in the wallet. And now it does. You know, I forget the name of it, but um, there was some other project we talked about maybe four or five months ago trying to do the, the same kind of thing. Solidity. <clears throat> no. Uh, but, um, you know, obviously I think Miniscript is probably going to be the, the thing that takes off given the, the people working behind it. But, you know, this is just about making like the lower level aspects of what Bitcoin script and like the, the network is capable of more accessible at a level, um, a higher level. And most importantly, making it accessible safely at that higher level so that it's easier to just deal with the, the custom primitives and, and combinations you can get out of that. So it's for me, it's kind of hard to argue for Miniscript by spending the last three years on shitting on Ethereum and how useless smart contracts are. Why? A blockchain should be just used for money transfer and maybe some niche, uh, maybe what? some niche uh, cool application come out like ne Lightning Network and maybe Liquid. That that maybe that's two the only two that that came out of the while well, Bitcoin scriptability didn't it so it, it, it's it's hard to argue but uh, I mean it's Peter Woolley we talk about uh, so I mean it it's it's either useless or a huge eye-opener for me right so yeah what do you, what do you mean like all it is is the current Bitcoin scripting language in a higher level language yeah, but uh, what I mean is that the current Bitcoin what does, but what does that the have current to do scripting with... language of any blockchain is like well, it's nice, but you can't really. There are no no use cases, right? Only Lightning and 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 Liquid and no other use case came out of the huge scriptability of Ethereum. So that's that's what I mean by this. What are you talking about? You can build multi-sig Chalmy and eCash servers. You can build channel factories, state chains. Like I have an idea for a second layer that's like something I'm still working through and seeing if it's possible. Like it's, dude, there are a million things you can do with the scripting language. Like, and making that accessible is huge because 
anybody can start playing with that now. It's it's a lot easier and more accessible. But, but man, there's a contradiction there that uh, look, look how, how we judge Ethereum is that what they delivered and it's absolutely nothing. And how we how you argue now is that well it has the potential of to do this and this and this oh, cool, but there is a double standard there, you know. Like what? I mean being being against Ethereum or thinking that it was poorly implemented doesn't mean that you don't think like flexible smart contracts have value. It's just that the way Ethereum did it is kind of like they rush to build all of the exciting sounding stuff and they still can't even do basic multi-sig like and that's not what bitcoin wants to do bitcoin development is focused around building the simple stuff first and making sure it's safe and then building higher so i don't i mean i definitely think that more complicated smart contracts are important so yeah i mean like i don't know i feel like this is only a good thing yeah i mean that's where it's like it was kind of always in the roadmap right that it's like bitcoin's programmable money and you know you can do interesting things with this but um you know like we're saying earlier bitcoin's rock it's something that has to be solid and steady and and it's gotten to that and like you know that's where it's like back in what was it 2014 2013 whenever like these like ethereum foundation really kind of started coalescing on like hey you know like this thing's gonna take forever we're gonna do it we're going to solve this problem for Bitcoin. And like, you know, now we are where we are and, you know, Bitcoin has SegWit and, you know, we actually have this thing, you know, yeah, we have like several scripting situations that help different, uh, different things on the network. And now that's just a little bit easier with this language. So, yeah, I mean, like, I think it's a good thing. I mean, like the whole Ethereum smart contract story, I mean, that wasn't really the problem. The problem was them just like having the pre-mind, the foundation, the central leader, the uh, the like the way that they kind of all coalesced under their use cases of like this was the DAO or though it's the ICO or now it's ETH 2.0. I mean, like there's like a lot of other problems with Ethereum that's got nothing to do with smart contracts. It's just about like the not <clears throat> minimizing externalities and running something like, you know, having Bitcoin script more accessible and easier to work with and analyze like that's going to be an amazing thing. And like, I don't even want to like try and like predict what can come of that because it's like, who knows what somebody is going to come up with when you just make the, the low level script that much easier for people to work with and play with. Yes. Yeah, so th that's what I have a problem with. I, I, I definitely think it's a good thing, of course, but not an amazing thing. I mean, maybe an amazing engineering, but I don't. So there is just, nothing came out of ethereum of the most flexible programming blockchain right and because people that's... built it like morons with recursion <laughs> that you just paid for if it's recursive with arbitrary like flex like it was retarded it's not because it's not that fucking smart contracts can't do complicated things it's that you're pointing at a group of retards who did it like a bunch of retards and saying that proves that they're useless. That's nonsense. Okay, but that's the best data we have, you know? No, it's not. It's not, like, data. Like, dude, like... You can't point at a group of idiots trying to build a car by putting, like, square fucking things on the wheels and like filling the engine with fucking cow piss and then point and say like you know the fucking it's impossible to make cars more gas efficient like no you're you're looking at retards that's not valid datum so your point is that ethereum wants to be build spaceships and that's why they all failed and if they would have want to build cars instead then they would have maybe succeeded at to some degree is that 
Yeah, maybe. <laughs> so I think that if they them. weren't retarded, that yes, something could have launched in the Ethereum world that was not retarded and doomed to fail. But that's not what happened. Uh, let's, I guess let's, I guess I can get behind that. Yeah. Let's frame it this way: Ethereum tried to build a rocket ship, even though they don't even have the skill to build a car without it blowing up. That's basically what happened. That's a good way to say it. A rocket ship that can undergo underwater, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, submarine rocket ship. All it right. Makes, actually, this... Okay, just last thing. This actually kind of makes me want to just build the IDA for for Miniscript. This would be so so much fun, uh, and I would I would really figure out if there is something something interesting or not. I mean, like Dopar, how is this not valuable and interesting? Like this language, if you can figure out how you write basic Python scripts that do math. You can sit there and come up with your own custom scripts. Like if I want a multi-sig wallet that I can spend myself, but my wife can spend with a slight delay herself, but like my parents can can spend with her parents in like three months, I just code that out, drop it in my wallet, and my wallet can do that now. Like that will be an amazingly powerful tool for this ecosystem. Amazingly powerful. <laughs> Fuck. One moment. I hey, is my phone dead? No. Can no. you hear me? Uh, okay. Then no, it's not amazing. The, it's... <laughs> yeah, oh my god, uh, dude. Like, I okay, think we need we need to like to move pull... on. <laughs> All we're, right. we're going to establish no. a voting protocol Ugh. where, like, if Nopara is just disagreeing to disagree and the three of us agree on it, we can put him in a timeout or something. <laughs> Not a timeout. Is it, proof of, is, it, is it proof of stake? It's proof of subjective opinion. No, it's, it's always like because you're, you're over, overemphasizing the thing. What? No, Rick I'm not. And like, here, is like, no part, is like no part. Always I'm, something I'm, I'm, reasonable, I'm gonna, I'm but gonna then you, you say it I'm in the same way. No, 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 I'm gonna stop it here because like it's we're we're getting kind of close to the the two hour mark. But I I was planning on it, I'm gonna do a shy two fifty six episode on something like either t uh, today or tomorrow. But like watch you listen to that and you will see exactly what I'm saying. And, and and get how powerful something like Miniscript can be in the long term. All right, yeah. And like, you know, Bitstein said, we got to be relentlessly positive here. So let's see if we can be relentlessly positive and understand that all this news is good news for Bitcoin in this next story. So there is a developing thing, situation coming out of the Far East that really puts BitConnect to shame. BitConnect stole somewhere around $120 million plus dollars in Bitcoin, while this one has taken roughly $3 billion in Bitcoin, around 1% of the network supply. Like I said, this is a developing story, and it takes a while for the news to get translated and contextualized to where people can decide if it's something even to pay attention to. Back on June 27th, a few ringleaders to this large Ponzi scheme was arrested by Chinese authorities. The scam is called Plus Token, and it wasn't much different from BitConnect in just promising monthly returns from 10 to 30%. The Plus Token was on a couple of big exchanges, BitHum and Hoibi, and that got them access to large pools of liquidity. This got them more than 200,000 Bitcoins, 789,000 Ether, and 26 million EOS. Once people started having problems with drawing funds, it was a run on the system, and the house of cards started to fall. While all this was going on, the project would put out messaging trying to teach people how to use cryptocurrencies, which would lead the customer to just purchase more Bitcoin, Ether, and EOS for the scam. Even though some of the ringleaders were caught, the keys are set up in a multi-sig and someone is still out there with enough of the private keys to move the stolen funds. 
Large amounts of these funds were recently hitting exchanges, or it appears so, and could have been involved with large volumes of selling that led to the price falling under 10K recently. In fact, that's when all of this story popped out of the radar. I mean, here in the West, we didn't hear about this until the price fell under 10K. So this could be a case of the market grabbing a story to explain the price. However, there are blockchain analytics that show large portions of these holdings are moving around. So when this was breaking, it was mainly Dovi Wan on Twitter who was spilling information about the stolen funds. She was attempting to reach out to exchanges and blacklist the addresses associated with Plus Token, which this was a big no-no. Uh, you know, a lot of the community, the potential censorship, this fruitless effort just sort of destroys the propositions here. So anyway, after that, Dovi reached out to chain analytic companies that sent out targeted dust attacks in an attempt to track the funds. Soon after that, a few of the wallets with large amounts of Bitcoin were shattered and sent out Sent, it sent out dust ran, to random wallets trying to throw off the analytic companies. At least that's the way it appears. Right now, CypherTrace and PeckShield are both tracking the situation, and it's still developing. The two come out with competing arguments about the PLUS token. CypherTrace, CypherTrace says it's impossible to track when it's $3 billion in crypto, and they cannot confirm those Bitcoins hit exchanges. While PeckShield is saying they're tracking everything, and those coins have led to Bitcoin's price decline. Either way, this story highlights a couple of topics we should discuss. First off, there is still this giant information gap from east to west, and these bull market cycles will make that more evident as time goes on. Also, that these scams are still very prevalent and prolific going on in China. Is it possible that the analytic company in China is saying it can track the funds to keep and to try and keep those bitcoins in within their borders? Or is like the U.S. analytic company saying it's impossible to trace to allow those funds out of the country? I don't know. But this is a meaty story, and I'm sure we're going to keep coming back to this over time. But, uh, yeah, did you guys hear anything about this uh, over the past week, this plus token and billions being lost? I saw... No, but I haven't seen... I haven't seen the uh, chain analysis companies are competing with each other. That's really interesting. I saw a Dovey tweet about the um, like to the chain analysis company about the, the blacklisting stuff, but I was really busy that day, so I kind of just saw that and then dropped to the wayside, and I never followed back up on it. But yeah, it, it is it is kind of weird when you really just think about it, like that delay between east to west with news and, until it really gets big enough. There, there's just like a whole like category of stuff going on that people in, in the different areas don't know about in the other one just because it's like not big enough or important enough <laughs> well this is where it's like is like the price telling us something are we translating something through the price where it's like the price fell below a number and so like we had to search for this answer or was it like the other way around i mean like i always am curious on that with these kind of you know stories I don't think we'll ever know. Yeah, either way, like the chain analysis aspect of it is very interesting. Like that's what really captured my interest was whenever I saw like the, you know, on Twitter, you know, this girl, she's trying, you know, this Dovey, she's trying to uh, censor the transactions and that kind of stirred up this whole thing. And then, you know, they started talking about chain analytic companies tracking it. And then soon after that it was like oh no those wallets that they sent dust attacks to are targeted dust attacks to are actually now all a bunch of dust going in every which direction and now you actually have chain analytic companies in competing narratives about the coins and like i wonder if that has to do with like allowing custody outside of different geographical regions or is that like just there's two different you know sets of information that they're looking at or through different models Either way, it's interesting, and it's like we're saying, it's a ton of money. I mean, I'm sure we'll, you know, like we'll keep getting information about this as time goes on. So just a little side note there, I don't think any dust attack can confuse any chain or is this company. That's, that's just a very, very distinct thing that's easy, easy to yeah. notice and filter out. It'd be a real shame if they, you know, started sending 
significant amounts of Bitcoin to random addresses. I don't know, like the one I put out on Twitter. That's a crazy (laughs) idea. Not a dust attack, but like a lottery attack or something. Well, I mean, it's it's like it's something people have talked about for years when looking at some of these bigger attacks. Like you know, the the dust stuff is really you know like no parasite irrelevant. But like if you actually just started dump like if you stole a hundred thousand bitcoin and then just like went okay i'll give ninety thousand of it away then you can really start trying to like blend and move and hide around and like try to get some of those funds into a place or a state you can use them but like nobody's ever actually done that you know what i mean Ooh, man. Yeah, you don't have 90,000 you can just send a couple of bitcoins to here and there and then no and but then, my, my point is like no well, part. If, if you give away from there. if you stole 100,000 bitcoin and give away 90,000 10,000 is still a fuck ton of money that you just got away with and if you get if you really do it right like giving that 90,000 away you could set that up so that there are hundreds or thousands of other people that now have that chunk of money that are all doing their own thing, mixing it around and scattering the coins around. Like it's way easier for you to try to like hide things and like disappear into the crowd that way than like, you know, just trying to keep everything, especially like anybody who gets busted trying to like sell or do anything with that money is like well are you a thief or just a random like guy who got sent money and you know what i mean like it, it's it would just make a clusterfuck that would make it so hard to actually catch you yeah i agree it's uh i mean yeah you send a lot of money to somewhere and they are starting to track that someone right and then he's gonna say hey someone just sent me this money i i didn't know about this uh like they, they deny it like yeah and do that it's, with it's, a it's an interesting uh, false false leading there is a lot of energy goes into trying to investigate hey was this just a misdirection or not yeah and if you do that with like a few hundred people or a few thousand people good luck finding the guy who actually hacked it you know what i mean Alrighty, so I'm going to take that little silence as uh, there's nothing else to say, and we should move along to Janine's last thing. Done enough. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. So you uh, guys might have seen it now by today because it got a lot more attention, but um, a few days ago I started, well, last week I said that I was interested in building a wallet compatibility guide because... Like when you generate a wallet and you use it and, you know, something goes wrong or maybe you just want to change wallets, most people have no freaking clue where they could possibly migrate to, you know, if any given wallet stops working. And so I wanted to build a guide that would show, I mean, at the at a very basic level, just which which wallets implement which BIPs and do they have any inconsistencies that would render them incompatible. So I started working on that and then um, Rodolfo was also starting to work on one as well, independent from me. And so we decided to collaborate and now there's a... Um, there's a guide that com- kind of combines elements of both of ours um, at walletsrecovery.org. And yeah, so I just wanted to mention a few, like, um, well, first of all, um, Samurai and Wasabi both now have um, pages on their support or FAQ sections of the website that talk about which BIPs they support. So that's awesome. But most wallets don't have that. And it's very frustrating, but hopefully more of them will jump on board. Um but I'm thinking that, like, unless a lot of this stuff significantly changes, I should probably change the name of the guide to Incompatibility Guide, because seriously, if you even look at, um, there's a complementary one that focuses just on SegWit and RBF that was made by um, Bitcoin Optech, and holy frick, like, they, even if you say yes, they te- technically implement, you know, this or that BIP, 
if you actually look at, you know, whether they have sending or receiving support, it's like a giant mess for mo most wallets. Like, it's just, yes, I did. Yes, I did, Shinobi. Come on. It's holy fuck. I think we had enough. It's uh, holy fuck. <laughs> <laughs> no. Anyway, so yeah, there is basically very little compatibility in the Bitcoin wallet space, and we should fix that because this is just a mess. Like I, off the top of my head, I can't even say at the moment. Like I mean, there's some that I know work together in terms of like software wallets and hardware wallets. Because they explicitly say that, you know, they work together. But other than, like, Electrum and various hardware wallets, but outside of that, it's a minefield. It's a complete minefield. So, please, if you can help with that, um, there, like I said, it's at walletsrecovery.org. Uh, That's the main one, and that has link links to the GitHub where you can contribute or um, tweet at one of us. Um, as well, if you find stuff that could help, because yeah, it's it's just a mess. But this is important because most people have no freaking clue which wallets can go together or why if they you know recover a seed into a wallet that they didn't originally generate it in, they don't understand why their funds aren't appearing. It looks like they've been stolen when they actually haven't. It just means that they're probably using a different derivation path. So. Yeah, we need to fix this, or at least make make people aware of how messed up it all is. So let's do that. Mm -hmm. Like, yes, 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 yes. Like, I, I have been saying for years that all wallets, and yes, I'm sorry, Nopara, all wallets are complete shit right now. Because there's no standards, like, compatibility sucks, and, like, this... Like no, what, you, what you and, no, and so Adolfo are doing the problem, are like, not only is this going to help users, but this is also something that everybody can use to just shame the fuck out of shitty wallets and like be like, what the hell are you doing? And like, sorry, sorry, I talked over you a bit there, but you were kind of lagging in and out and I couldn't hear it at all. Yeah, so w one uh, correction to that. Um, the problem isn't that we, I mean... We have a lot of standards, we have a lot of BIPs, but wallets are not transparent about which ones they implement most of the time, or some of them, like, they say they implement them, but they really don't in any complete way. Um, and there was, I think, someone, I think it was Rodolfo and someone else, they actually tweeted the XKCD comic, which talks about... Um, standards? Yeah, let me look at it. Yeah, so how standards proliferate, and the first uh, first box says situation. There are 14 competing standards, and then um, I can't remember the character names, but it's like, 14, ridiculous, we need to develop one universal standard that covers everyone's use cases. Yeah, and then the third uh, box says situation. There are now 15 competing standards. <laughs> so, yeah, that's, yeah, we have to be careful with that. But yeah, there's a lot of bips. Most people don't know what they mean. Um, so you should familiarize yourself with what they mean, but more importantly, you should just know whether, you know, if this wall and this wall letter are implementing completely different BIPs from each other or not implementing that all, implementing them at all, they're probably not compatible with each other, except in a very complicated way that involves command line stuff, which most people can't use. So yeah, that's bad. Mm -hmm. But you know, I mean, like, th it's just like things suck. It, like it's gotten better over like the last year or so like i will say that but it, it's things still suck like it, like shit like mini script like psbt like those things will help enormously but like even though things are getting better at layer one like the second that's like second layers start taking off like we're just going to be right back to like the same thing except exponentially worse and it, it's like this like I, I, I would like to see second layers kind of learn from the years of just everything being complete shit that first layer wallets went through instead of just repeating that. You know what I mean? Yeah, I mean, like, I think it's a great initiative you're doing there, Gene. Yeah, everybody, 
bust out some random wallets and test net coins and start tinkering with stuff and contributing to this because this is important both for helping noobs and also for shaming uh, wallets that are doing a really shit job. This is, this is not going yeah, to no. happen, uh, the compatibility part that I go ahead, Jenny, before that. No, you, you can go ahead. Yes, it will. It's Compatibility will happen, no card, just like the web has it with HTTP and HTTPS and SMTP and FTP and all, all the, the suit of protocols that everything uses. Like, people will, it'll just be messy and a clusterfuck getting there because this is all bottom up. I mean, I mean every so bullet has... for guides, I think actually at even compatibility is kind of a secondary goal. The primary goal is to just make people aware that they're not compatible because there's a whole bunch of people that will think, oh, well, this is a 12 word mnemonic. Like even if, if they even know what a seed is, they'll be like, okay, this has a 12 word mnemonic seed. That means I can, I can put that into any wallet that accepts a 12 word mnemonic which you know not all of them do some accept different uh like electrum for example i think i think it still uses 13 um which no i don't think any other wallet uses a 13 word mnemonic um and so yeah it's it's more about making people aware that they're not compatible and so then they don't like if they come across an issue where it doesn't recover into a given wallet they don't need to freak out because well, you know, you can just explain to them they're just not compatible wallets. So it's more about making people aware of the incompatibility and then maybe hopefully we'll get compatibility at some point in the future. But that's the secondary goal. Yeah, we, we will get compatibility after we lose, uh, <clears throat> after we are not innovating anymore, after we lose innovability. Because the every wallet is very unique. Things to it. Electrum always implements stuff before the beeps come out, and that's that's their their thing. That's their edge case. They are the hacker wallet, right? In Wasabi, it's a, our perspective on it. It's a really bad idea to import Wasabi into another wallet, although you are able to because. I was stupid and I did not prevent it before. No, but so like, now everyone is doing that. But yes. like no part. Like think about it though. It's it's not though. As long as the other wallet doesn't like deal with the post mix stuff. And it's like you know, my point is like you know all of these like these things will arrive at common solutions and like standards and shit. And it's it'll just be messy and take a while. Like eventually, I think like this specific issue, like any wallet that integrates coin join stuff like you know wasabi and samurai have i think will eventually like just wind up using like a standard post mix derivation and wallets that don't support that like coin join functionality just will not like go check that and so you can import and use premix stuff but you know what i mean you have to go find this other thing to use the post mix stuff yeah uh, <laughs> and i also I also want well to say that, that like a particular wallet being incompatible does not it's not necessarily like a bad thing like especially if it's incompatible for good re reasons like wasabi because it's doing specific things towards privacy that most other wallets aren't doing so being incompatible is not necessarily bad I, like like I said the primary goal is to make people aware that they're incompatible so that when that happens, they, you know, they have to figure out a different way of moving those funds into that wallet than just doing, you know, importing a mnemonic. So, yeah. You know, when I created Zero Link, Zero Link is a fungibility framework. I created this instead of just creating the, my own own mixing technique. No, I I wanted to. I wanted to extend this whole thing and worked a lot, very hard on it. So be able for other wallets to integrate. And now what happened now, the only wallets, those were interested in it, all came up with, <laughs> not only did not move to, towards being, being more similar, but came up with their own mixing techniques. So it, it just, 
I don't see happening if even even this I I, I miserably failed in this goal of no zero. Para. Okay, <laughs> this is this is I'm moving for a timeout vote because you're just being negative for no reason. <laughs> Things will will settle out, dude. Like these this this is not gonna happen overnight or in a year or two. There is no authority, but like people will eventually start settling on like standards like there doesn't have to be one standard on coin joining there can be multiple ways to coin join but what really matters is the wallets being able to like interact with keys and transfer keys between each other and as long as that's like settled out that's fine there can be different techniques for mixing but it, it's like it's, stop being so negative Listen, listen, listen to Nick. Positivity. Relentless positivity. Yeah, man. <laughs> okay. Oh, wait, crap. Never mind. Um, Michael, I just, I just confused two people. I apologize. We must be way over the time by now, right? Ah, like 15 minutes or so. Let's, yeah. Okay, final thoughts time. Into those. That was right. my final thought. <laughs> yeah, since that was yours, I'll post no, mine it here. Wasn't. Final thoughts don't have show notes. Final thoughts begin. All right, so I just posted mine into the mumble chat, and uh, it's something that came up earlier this week. It's uh, at underscore, 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 underscore. Jeremy, you guys know him as Seaside Crypto. He was uh, running the meetup out there and like uh, unfortunately had to put everything down. But he's going on a road trip around the West Coast. Uh, there you could see like, a, well, if you're in the mumble, you can click and see. And we'll maybe put in the show notes later. Uh, he's taking a trip around the West and he's going to be stopping around Boulder. So just wanted to give a shout out to anybody that's in that path to see if you can bump into him. And I'm going to make sure he comes down here. And just another, yeah, make sure that we get together and we have a beer, you know, got to get him to come through the meetup. And then just one more thing is I want to give a shout out to the guys that made it into the mumble today because, like, you know, this is where we're doing the show now. And, uh, you know, it's nice having this chat where we got guys, you know, they're putting images in here. There's links. You know, there's a lot. This is a different story than YouTube. So audio, video, tweaker. Hulls, Satwell, Jaw, Sheep, Posery, Mr. Hodel, Stop and Decrip, Expired Paycheck, uh, you know, uh, 2600, you're here with us too, like there's been a couple of people we don't really quite know, but that's cool, that's what we like about the mumble, and so, you know, we need to get the regulars in here, where's Truth Monster, where's Booger's Guy, you know, and I know I'm forgetting a ton more, all you guys out there that are listening right now, that ain't in the mumble for this thing live. You guys need to get this thing configured because this is where it's happening. Da-na-na. No para. Final thought time. I I already had one, but okay, here is another one. So let's fire Shinobi Monkey and hire Shinobi's toilet. <laughs> um, his mic quality <laughs> sucks compared to oh my, my god. <laughs> oh, that explains it. Yeah, I told you that's I was doing that so that I could still hear you guys when I was rinsing the cat hair out of my eyes, so that when I came back, I I knew what was going on in the conversation. Man, you gotta clean that apartment, dude. It's a war on cat hair every day. That doesn't help when the cat climbs on top of my face when I'm asleep and like rolls <laughs> around in my eye. No, it doesn't. All right. See so if it if Janine. Let's it was you, me let's and my cat a, climbed on my no, face. No, I would no, wake no, up immediately. No, no, no. Okay, Janine, we're going to get you a final <laughs> thought in and then get mine in and then end because we're like 20 minutes over two hours almost. Go on, final thought it. Okay. Going once. Going twice. Going she through. having a relationship right, with a cut. <laughs> End of story. We are done. I'm doing a Shy 256 episode about cool stuff soon. Watch it. Bye, guys. Bye. Later, everyone.